Hello, everybody, and welcome to Grow with Katie Live at Homestead Gardens. I have our guest today, Donald Pell from Donald Pell Design. Hey, Don, how are you? Good, Katie. How are you doing? Great. And I thought it was perfect to end on this little picture because I'm going to hide now because it's so tiny. Um, <laughs> because we are all having a snow day. What's I know. The like? I mean, you're not that far from me, but how's your weather? Yeah, it's just got started getting a little... Uh, you know, icy, but uh, I was just walking around in my garden, actually taking some pictures in the snow. So it was really, it's, it's, it's fine. Well, but you know, that's the beautiful thing is we, uh, using a landscape designer, which is what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna be talking about hiring a landscape designer, why you should, maybe some secrets. And if you can't, Donald's gonna share his tips on how to create a beautiful garden all in 30 minutes. That's right, <laughs> make you all experts. Um, but you know, Gardens should be beautiful all four seasons. You know, here in, in our Pennsylvania region, in the Chesapeake region where Homestead is, where like like likely lots of you are, um, we are we can have four seasons of interest, right? We can. I mean, I, I love the autumn and the winter landscape, and I'm always blown away how we go out and cut back our herbaceous plants um, that have so much interest in the winter. Um, and we see this all the time. Um, not only is it bad to manage the gardens, but if you're cutting all that, um, material back but you're missing such a beautiful opportunity in the garden and I'm so drawn to that landscape um, I grew up uh, in what we called a field you know you might call it grassland nowadays and uh, I'm sure that's why I do the work I do I was just um, you know it has such a romantic memory for me and um, I love that landscape I love it now just driving around uh, you know this part of Chester County I live in in Pennsylvania and um, yeah, I think we just so often miss the beauty of the winter landscape. I mean, we think about spring and we think about summer. Um, and certainly we, in the middle of land, we have this great autumn tree color. But um, in particular, I'm always thinking about the winter landscape myself. Yes. Oh, my gosh. That, and I think that is so neat. And that was a little PSA. Do not trim back your plants unless it's a, you know, you must and you want to control yeah. your size. But in the fall, that not only for winter interest, but for our little friends, you know, all of our pollinator and bird friends. That's well, right. Um, which is something that you're very passionate about in your design. Our I am. Planting for for wildlife, for nature. Um, you know, that's I think one of the ways I heard your designs described is wholeheartedly American. And I thought, what does that even mean? But as you just described that, that feel, that expanse, that prairie look, but very um, cultivated. You know, it looks wild, but there is a lot of purpose in that design to make sure that it's working in harmony, that it's it's producing for the the native wildlife. And with as few inputs as possible, is that would that be accurate? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think our work just came from not the touchstone of the English garden. Um, certainly, uh, you know, I grew up really admiring the German and Dutch designers, but uh, in particular some of the German designers. But uh, you know, I think I learned the most just from my regional landscape and as a young person going out and hiking and experiencing those places. And that was the idea of not just american like a nationalistic american approach but just the place i'm familiar with and that's my regional landscape and um, even if we're um, working out of our local region which we've had the good fortune to do you know i try to experience those places and understand what makes them unique but often the emotion carries you know through these landscapes and um, that's what I'm really interested in exploring, I'm trying to create that touchstone for people so they have a beloved habitat. Um, um, and, and, you know, uh, we're supposed to be, I'm supposed to be talking about that. We, we had the good fortune to be doing the Philadelphia Flower Show this year. Um, it's the first time where I've ever been interested in doing an exhibit, but it's going to be outside this year. Yeah. And uh, the theme is na uh, habitat, nature's masterpiece. Um, and so that was really interesting for us to explore, you know, what that means. Um, and so I think we have our kind of unique spin on um, what habitat means to people, or to me at least, and kind of the idea we want to forward. So that's um, that's kind of an exciting new project we're working Wait, on. Wait, is that the first? You didn't, I don't know how you kept that for me in the 15 minutes before we were chatting, by the way. Um, is this the first time you're talking about it? Are we announcing this here? Yeah, I guess we are. I, I got, I got read the Riot Act that I had to bring it up by um, someone who works with us, um, 
Karen Meadows, whose birthday Thank is you, today. Karen. Happy birthday, yeah. Karen. <laughs> um, and Karen said, don't forget to talk about the flower show. But that was truly an organic segue, honestly. <laughs> um, just thinking about, um, you know, habitat is just not about Lepidoptera and birds. It's To me, it really starts with people. And I, I'm always thinking about that. Maybe it's selfishly, but I feel like if you can connect people to their own habitat, you know, they'll in, in the landscape, they'll start to really value that in the future and kind of create their own model of conservation. And I think that's so very important. I don't want to tell anyone what conservation is or what gardening is or anything. You know, um, if they're drawn to certain ideas, they will start to value them. And hopefully they'll be really positive, healthy ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of the, the um, narrative I'm interested in exploring, certainly when it comes to the flower show. But I think generally that's our work. I'm not dogmatic about anything. I don't follow rules. I'm really formally uneducated, as it were, and um, I'm certainly am interested in emotional, healthy places. And so that's what we tend to uh, explore. And more and more people are finding, I'm sure all of you guys out there feel that way already, but more and more people this year have discovered their gardens as those emotional, healthy places. And I love that. I love that people are tapping into our products to, to increase their well-being. It's such a cool thing. That's right. We can't travel to Positano this year. So, you know, you're going to have to find a beautiful landscape at home. Yes. And, um, you know, that's okay. It can, be, it can be an amazing place that you'll really value to be in. So. so I do my research for these shows, but Heather just told me you're the 2020 APLD Designer of the Year. Oh, I don't know that to be true. Oh, maybe. Well, Heather? She said question mark, so we'll, we'll come no, back. Okay. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't think that's true. <laughs> you were a silver award winner, though. Uh, we, uh, won a gold, we won a gold medal this year through APLD. There you go. Um, we won a merit award last year, and we won an award through PPA last year. Our only three awards we've ever, um, you know, applied for. I get told we have to do these things. Who knows, maybe it's so weird. Gonna... Awards for art, kind of yeah. a weird thing. Yeah. But um, no, I don't, um, I love Heather. She's been so sweet to us and generous. Um, I don't know why, but um, I don't know that you're right about that, Heather. <laughs> well, you're a winner. You're the designer of the year in our mind. So, right. um, well, you guys have questions. Listen, we're all sitting here on a snow day. I see a lot of snow emojis in the chat. So, um, we are here to answer your questions. I have a bunch because I've got a big expansive yard that I want to turn into a wholeheartedly American de de designed backyard. But um, you guys tell us what your questions are. So give it, give them to us for Don about your backyard specifically or just in general about design. But and also tell us where you're where you're tuning in from. Um, Naomi Brooks also says hi. Oh, Our yeah. show memories. Um, all right. So we already covered your style. Um, we talked a little bit about where to start. You talked about the people, you know, just not just designing with plants for wildlife, but for people. So is that where you typically start? What is, you know, as we're sitting here dreaming up, I love the quote that for the people who think that gardening begins in the spring, they miss the best part. They yes. miss the dream. You know, this February 1st, here we are, rabbit, rabbit, we miss the dream. So yes. um, help us dream. Where do we start? Do we get a piece of paper? Where are, where are we starting our dreams? Um, you know, typically I like to think really broadly about places and I don't get too bogged down in plant selections, although I'm a tried and true kind of plant junkie. Um, I really think about placemaking always to start mm -hmm. with. I want to really activate an entire landscape and understand what place what the space is in a landscape um I, that often that comes to me with a memory you know a place i've been that recalls um, something evocative of the place i'm in mm -hmm. and how we connect those spaces and places and moments in a landscape um i think it's really important to think broadly i look at plants often as just you know, these materials that can create things like walls or scrims or rivers and don't get too bogged down. I mean, there's been such a dearth of 
material in the industry, uh, we're even growing a little bit ourselves now just to um, understand plants and be able to acquire plants that are difficult to uh, get our hands on. Um, but truly, I like to think kind of big picture, what if there were no limitations on resources? And then we start really simplifying from there. Often when we do drawings for folks, I don't even know what that tree is going to be that I draw in a mm -hmm. corner. I don't know what I can get. Mm -hmm. um, I can certainly find that perfect tree, but I might need to go to 12 nurseries to tag that perfect specimen. And then, you know, the, the costs get really out of hand. So we're, I'm always trying to just do more with less. Mm -hmm. um, I started my business. Nobody knew who I was. I didn't have an education from Penn or Harvard. And, you know, people would give me maybe $500. And I really had to understand how to stretch that budget out to make it look like something. I wasn't interested in, you know, maximizing profits. I mean, I'm still the detriment of the company to that end. You know, I always want to do more. And often I do. <laughs> um, I certainly have folks to help keep me in check, but I'm I'm just trying to do as much as I can with um, any given project. And so, um, you know, thinking about space is paramount to me. And then we can start to engineer the whole construction project based on resources, you know, and sometimes that's using really aggressive plants. Sometimes there's more of a budget and we can get more depth with more layering. Um, but in terms of the big plan, again, just thinking broadly and holistically um, about the connectivity of the landscape is really important to me. So when you say thinking about space, are you looking at, um, I live in an 1896 barn. Are you looking at like my aesthetics of my interior? Are you looking at the the history of the space? Or are you actually looking at where the sun hits the space? Is the soil rocky? Is there a slope? Or is it both when you're talking space? Yeah, I, I love architecture and I generally understand um, the vernacular of an architecture and I could care less about it as it relates to a garden. Um, you know, those things can and should be mutually exclusive. Um, I'm kind of a modernist in my approach to landscapes, and, and that's really thinking about stripping away the superfluous um, and just what people need to live beautifully. Mm. And if there's more resources, you know, we can certainly add on mica schist walls and things like that where it makes sense. But again, how can we build for people who don't have many resources. Um, we need to learn about plants, material usage. Um, but I'm thinking about the cultural conditions of the site, the soil, the hydrology, the exposure. Um, and we need to understand that to be able to get plants to function uh, and, and thrive on in any given landscape. And we've been in, uh, I've certainly made, I think a lot of mistakes. You know, I've been doing this since I was 19 professionally. Um, and, you know, with those mistakes, um, w we just learn more, um, but that's really it. Trying to understand what plants can help make a landscape. Um, and, and that's what I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. Great. Good distinction. Because I know a lot of people do take into account the architecture of the, of the home, but I think oftentimes that doesn't, what you want outside, so many people don't know. Um, but also it doesn't, I like how you say one has, doesn't have to correlate with the other. It, it doesn't. And, and again, if it's very simple, I always harken back, I think it's the Atkins Museum I got to see in Kansas City. And that's this incredible Bow Arts um, building that was very beloved. And they wanted to put an addition and they opted for this just modernist glass box. And, you know, there was, of course, uproar because there always is. Um, and, and yet, it's, I think, been a really successful design and, and has become very appreciated in that it doesn't try to compete with that architecture. And I'm not interested in um, kind of period vernacular landscapes. I build landscapes that resonate with me and people love to use words to describe that. And I certainly have. I borrowed Wolfgang's terminology of the New American Garden. Um, but it, they're they're just gardens to me, and mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how else to build them. Mm -hmm. um, 
So they're for people who want gardens. You know, they the type of work I do resonates with people. I'm not looking to build anything other than that. And um, mm -hmm. that's what I'm good at. And um, that's what is in my heart. And so that's what I'm looking to do, kind of express those ideas to people who, who want those ideas. Yeah, a couple more beginner questions, like when we're just starting. I just read an article um, from Howells that you shared because you're, of course, you're featured in all types. You guys, you've got a little mini celebrity here. You're always featured in articles, but this Howells article was nine, what was it? You just shared it. Design tips to enhance the view of your garden from inside. So I feel like that's another very popular point that I hear designers say. Stand inside your house, like at your kitchen. Where do you see from the inside out? But it, yes. okay, is that a good thing? Because you've seen like, oh. you're, you're challenging all my assumptions. So, but yeah. you do like that in the beginning. You're like seeing you washing me? dishes. What do you see? Okay. Yeah, I mean, we, I have these aronia in my window and uh, Longwood was crazy enough to let me teach a class out there uh, two years ago. And um, the, the Eastern bluebird comes in to eat the berries on that aronia every year. And you would have thought I just won the lottery one day. You know, the, the I was so excited when the bluebirds finally showed up so I could take these photos to show the class. Everyone in the office was laughing at me. But um, <laughs> that, yeah, and I, I'm always putting things in windows. You know, I don't want to block them. If you have a plant like Aronia, you might need to just prune it out ever so slightly as to not block the light. Or I use plants like Philectrum rotubrianum often. Um, I love those beautiful silhouettes in a window. Um, I love kind of framing a view out of a window. Um, I really, even the work outside, I want to kind of hearken you to another place, you know, make yeah. it kind of sexy to want to go to that mm -hmm. place beyond. And um, the window is certainly a great opportunity to do that. And, um, and why not? So, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. Yeah, because we spend a lot of time outside, but we spend more time inside. Some of us, you probably don't, but so let's make sure we can see the be beautiful features of our garden. That's cool. Yeah. Um, Heidi has a question. She's saying, thank you for saying you make mistakes. Mistakes are how we learn. But do you always plan biggest to smallest? Like you just said, you start broad. Do you always do that or do you sometimes take a pocket and, you know, if I can only afford right now to work on my fire pit area, is that something I should concentrate on or should I start with the broad and then work down? Um, so, so I think generally um, the work I am able to do anymore are kind of these larger spaces, right? Where we're, we're master planning and, but that wasn't always the case. And so to answer her question, if you're really interested in the garden, I think it's really fun. It's a fun, um, practice to think about the entire property and you could just simply take a google earth image of mm -hmm. your property and start to doodle on top of it and that's a really fun experiment you can buy a roll of trace paper from amazon and have fun just tracing over uh just take a magic marker and the one thing i've gotten better at in my career is not trying to get bogged down into the esoteric details of a plan is to really think broadly about how you want to move through space and how you want to define those spaces um, but to answer the question you know if you have this moment in the garden that resonates with you it's a, a place you want to be and that's where you want to have fires um, you know you could think just simply about all right how do we optimize that place is it to be exposed to everybody is it to create more of an immersive quality is it to just simply like the fire ring I have in my home, just a simple row, row of boulders set together? Or do we have the resources to buy a beautiful, beautiful copper bowl and set that at grade? Um, so I think, you know, again, much like my education has been, it, it was totally born out of ignorance and just the, the fascination with wanting to understand. And, and quite frankly, hating rules in general and that's just probably my personality but um i think with the garden it, it always should just whittle down to the fact that i i think there's a great opportunity to just have an incredible life experiencing things 
And that's not to get anxious that you don't have the perfect garden because there is no perfect garden. No you know, perfect like there's, there's literally just the perfect imperfect. And I've said that before. And I think for those of us who are able to enjoy that idea, we're very lucky because I understand the anxiety of people who want perfection, but that's just, it's unfortunate because I, I do feel lucky that I just find so much joy in sharing the landscape and gardens and plants and architecture with people. And um, so again, I think if you only have the resources and the bandwidth to think about a small space, then just do that and, and enjoy that experience. And so then if I were to hire a designer, should I have done that process beforehand? and then come to you with some ideas about what I want? Or do designers prefer that I say, you look at my backyard, you decide what's best? Yeah, I, I need ideas from folks because I need to know if we're, I'm even a good fit for them. You know, mm -hmm. if their ideas are so far off, um, you know, and for the owners, I think you want, I want my clients to have a great experience. I, and the owners should want to have a great experience. They should, be hiring someone who shares um, a vision with them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you showed some images of a job I did up in Lehigh County. Uh, we won the gold medal last year with APLD. And, and that owner originally showed us, um, I saw their site and it's a, an incredible landscape. You think you're in Wyoming and you're in Pennsylvania. The views are just right and that doesn't even really show the views you look back about 30 miles through a valley to, to hawk mountain and there's this bucolic rolling hills to the south and to the north there's lesser lake right in their backyard i mean it's it's the most exceptional landscape and yet when the owner who's an avid gardener showed me her images i had you know, I was kind of broken hearted and I called her and I said, I don't think I'm the right person for you. Um, this is so drastically different than what I would ever do. And she said, no, we just want your ideas. You know, we saw your work and we're open to something totally new. And so I think that's really important to come to the table because all design is, is a conversation. And mm -hmm. I think the client should start some of that conversation with what they think is important. Mm -hmm. And then it's, I think the idea of the designer to be honest and push back maybe and say, this is where what I think is exceptional or worth exploring and, you know, make sure you're, you're going to be of service to the owner. Um, and that's not by fighting them all the time. It's by understanding that you're of like minds early on. Mm -hmm. That's a great tip and visiting their the designer's website. So you'll get a great idea from their website about their aesthetic and you know, you either like that aesthetic and I don't know if you use Pinterest, but I Pinterest is a great place to go pin some ideas, tear some things out of a magazine, whatever you want to do, but collect some thoughts. And if it's from that designer's website and those are all the pictures you love and they inspire you great. Um, but I think that's a great, great tip is to come to the table with some ideas of what you like. So to make sure that you're happy. Um, and Homestead Gardens has a wonderful landscape division. The website, let me get it right, because it's different. It's landscape.homesteadgardens.com. So you'll see a great example of the projects that they've done as well, similarly to, to Donald, to Don's, that you know you can go and see, do I like that aesthetic? Which designer do I want to work with? And listen, we're making announcements here. They're doing a 10% off. If you go now and you can talk to them about 10% um, off your project, Tell them Don and Katie sent you, and so they give you that little discount. Uh, Landscape.homesteadgardens.com. Thank you, Audrey, for posting that right there. Um, so, other things that we start, we talked about a soil test. So, yes. is that something that designers would do, or if I'm trying to do this project myself, should I always do a soil test? Um, I think often it's an extremely valuable tool. Um, we actually work specifically with agronomists. Mm -hmm. I'm a generalist at best when it comes to soils and um, I work with an agronomist to really understand what are the soils, what shape the soils are in. And we do have a bunch of materials we use in our toolkit often, especially if it's a degraded suburban landscape. Um, and I look at all suburban landscapes as highly degraded. 
Um, you might think they're healthy, <laughs> but um, we, we most likely, even through, you know, commercial mowing practices, we're going to compact soils. You know, we get those machines on wet soils. We're going to start to degrade them. And so it's important to know uh, where you're at. Mm -hmm. And we don't typically um, apply conventional fertilization methods. Mm -hmm. We really look at soils and soil biology. We use a lot of tools like humates, um, humic acids. Um, in our soils in the Mid-Atlantic, we see a lot of compaction through heavy magnesium. So calciums are something we use um, often. Um, mulches, but even custom proper mulches. And I'm not talking about expensive mulches. I'm talking about just trying to recreate the ecology that might have been there. Trees tend to need a little more care than herbaceous plants. Um, to kind of rebalance the soil ecology um, in a more kind of fungal dominated soil compared to a more bacterial dominated soil that we'll typically find in grasslands. Um, and so uh, a really important tool for us to really understand like what's happening. Uh, again, we did a, a large project years ago um, for a landscape architect that was not from this region. It was kind of a very high profile job and um, there were conifers placed in this landscape, but the entire landscape was a floodplain and there was fragipan, which is this really fine, fine soil profile right below the soil surface. And so, you know, if you're gonna get into specifying or investing in some of these landscapes that can be, um, you know, consume a lot of resources, you really need to know what you're working with. If you're gonna buy six perennials, and put them in the ground and just enjoy that slow process. I don't know that you need to bring a, an agronomist onto your team, but um, if you're doing something substantive, I think it's important to really understand, you know, given the health of the existing landscape or the lack of um, kind of spontaneous vegetation, um, start to question what's happening. I identify weeds all the time in, this, in the landscape, and that's a great tool for me to try to understand, like, What's the secession that's happening here now and why? And the weeds tell a great story. Mm -hmm. So um, there are things I'm always looking for as well. Wow, then my background would tell a really good story. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of weeds. Um, and I also, Homestead has a great soil, te soil test. I agree with Don that, you know, listen, a couple perennials in a garden, but also in your, or your edible garden, I would highly recommend testing the soil there just to make sure, you know, even if you're doing raised beds, you know, if they sure. do have access to that ground. Yep. Um, all right. People want plants. People want to talk about plants. We are dreaming here, but you did mention at the top that there are some tried and true plants that you always use. Um, do you have some favorites? Like every garden always has. I saw some sea holly and I saw a lot of allium in some of your pictures. But those oh, are yeah. Photo stars. So they might just be the ones that look good in pictures. But what are some of your, your tried and trues? Yeah, I do love the alliums. That being said, you know, we started seeing astro yellows on them, which is um, a virus, so not in every landscape, but um, starting to uh, uh, bum me out a little bit. But um, th they're kind of no brainers, um, especially if you have, you know, reasonable drainage. They don't need extremely sharp drainage. Um, grasses, mm -hmm. um, you know, I love grasses from ear grasses, the millennias are a huge favorite of mine. For years, I was the kid in my 20s going to the man show, bugging all the nurserymen to grow millennias. They kept telling me they didn't grow here. Um, but I, I'm crazy about millennias as long as you have kind of a mesic um, soil profile. Um, panicums are great plants. Uh, I, you know, it's just uh, that plant, that garden is sharply drained. So Muhlenbergia, which I never get to play with, um, but we used that in mass in that garden, and I thought it was um, extremely beautiful. Uh, we shot some video of that garden. I think we're going to release it at some point, um, right when that was all in flower. And oh, I'm really excited about that. Um, uh, you know, there's a couple different um, sedges. I mean, it's funny. It's everything's in context, right? So if you saw a sedge in a in Homestead Gardens, for instance. You might say, you know, that looks like the weediest thing ever. But, you know, you start to compose that with things like geraniums and euphorbias 
uh, Dodia canthion, um, any any other herbaceous flowering plants. It just creates this beautiful kind of fecund tapestry on the ground plane. And those plants are workhorse plants. Mm -hmm. um, you, you almost you couldn't have enough sedges in a landscape, in my opinion, especially if you're just trying to, you know, create that living mulch that we need. Uh, just there's a dearth of that in garden planning. Um, everyone's throwing down mulch, which is usually the detriment often to a lot of these herbaceous plants. Um, but uh, again, um, though, you know, plants like that, and quite frankly, the real plants I'm looking for are just the plants that work in that specific cultural condition and affordable ones that I can get lots of. Um, I'm not obsessed with the new cone flower. Um, I just want really tough um, plants that will live very long in a landscape and that work in that specific landscape. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of, you know, as a designer, you might not think we run spreadsheets, but I run a lot of spreadsheets starting with plant, you know, um, schedules and then slowly edit those down. And I'm looking at extending out the interest of the bloom and seed head and all of those things mm -hmm. from um, winter right through uh, the following autumn. Um, as someone wrote Ansonia. God, I uh, can't get enough Ansonia in my life. Um, there it is. There's Hubrechtii. Um, fantastic plant. The Tabernay Montana family is, uh, or species, I should say, is a, a fantastic species. And in our own garden here that people often come and visit and, you know, we're kind of open to uh, kind of appointment, people just coming in and seeing um, what's growing here. I think we have six different Tabernay Montana wow. uh, uh, selections in our garden. And um, you know, they're just tough plants. Um, and that's what I'm looking for. So we've got some of your tried and true and, you know, Homestead's a great resource, the landscape design team, but they also have this pollinator club. They have the native habitat club. So there's a lot of different clubs you could be a part of if you yeah. to figure out which is the right thing for you. Because I think that's what pe I think that's what people get the, the hiccup here is okay well like you said in the beginning i'm not citing which tree it is i'm just saying this is where a tree should go yes well, we're all just stuck like well which tree should it be so um you're look, going back to that broad that sun shade is it a wet soil is what kind of soils do i have and that will narrow down the scope we all don't have spreadsheets which i'm sure is your favorite part of your job yeah. uh, <laughs> but um at then going to your going to homestead gardens and saying, okay, here are my conditions, and yes. you can help you choose a plant because you know, and you want those workhorse plants. You know, back to describing your style, as few inputs as possible. We don't want to bring in plants that will need a ton of fertilizer. That's uh, right. Of our care. We're all busy. Everybody here is busy. We all want to make our garden look beautiful, but do a lot of the work for us. That's right. And you know, you might you might want a magnolia grandiflora, and certainly there's more winter hardy um selections available out there i still wouldn't put them in the northwestern exposure you know but if you want a southern magnolia there's you know i'm all in favor of giving that to a client um we just want to try to be smart about where we cite it mm -hmm. um, there's nothing to say you can't have a couple specialty items um and you can put a little bit of care into those and they can be fine mm -hmm. but um again you know it's just for us looking at plants that are going to be very vigorous with limited inputs. Mm -hmm. um, I love plants and I do get excited about plants. But again, in terms of building a remarkable garden, uh, for me, I found um, a little less diversity is more at times. You know, we can get carried away and have three of each. Um, I'd rather, you know, 300 of each and, and kind of keep the tapestry a little more legible. Mm -hmm. um, but um, again, just looking for plants that are going to thrive in any given landscape. Mm -hmm. That's a great tip because oftentimes I think we go to the garden center and there's so many choices and they're all so beautiful. And yeah. the, the pollinators are fluttering all around each of them, which is how sometimes you can identify it's a pollinator plant. I know most of you out here probably know, but I love that. I love going to the garden center and you see out in, in the or nursery area, you know which plants are the pollinator plants, you know, when yes. they're um, but planting in mass, 
So I think that's a really good tip. Here's our little, another little designer tip. And all of Donald's designs, you can see how effective that is. Because instead of creating, you know, one cone flower and two cone flowers here, you get this, I mean, that Ansonia, it's right there, so I'll pop it back up again. I mean, this swap of beauty. Um, and you're also layering here. So let's talk a little bit more about that. You talked about the ground cover. Instead of mulch, are you layering from the top down when you're thinking about plants? Or are you going from the ground up? Yeah, I'm usually going from the ground up. I mean, the forms, you know, the, I start with the bigger forms, so shade trees, mm -hmm. um, architecture. Um, but certainly when I think about how a landscape is going to function, I'm thinking about, um, you know, um, pr uh, kind of a primary layer under plants and under things like sub shrubs or kind of taller basy um, plants. What's going to hold the ground plane? I think about cool season plants first. Mm -hmm. Because if your garden's full of warm season plants, they're very late to emerge in this season. And so you really need to think about plants that are going to come up early and shade out and out-compete cool season weeds. Um, so kind of a combination um, of cool season and warm season plants that are working together. Um, and even plants that will, will generally seed out in any given landscape. So if there are holes in a landscape, we have heavy bowl pressure um, because I'm on a 14 acre farm is where our offices are. So from the, the landscape around here, we have a lot of bowls. So we need to kind of plan and play that kind of chess game. If there is a hole, is something there that grows on stolons or rhizomes or can seed out aggressively, they kind of spontaneously start to fill in those spaces. Um, and so we're all always trying to plan for that. Um, and in our own practice, I think we're uh, all the time, we're getting better. We're thinking, we're learning about plants that can help be those kind of tools in our toolkit. Mm -hmm. um, and they can be beautiful layers. You know, they're just not purely functional. Um, they're beautiful for your habitat, you know, and they can be po very pollinator friendly. Um, so, um, you know, I, we're kind of thinking about the mul multiplicities of function and aesthetic beauty and um, all of the above. Yeah. And I think it's so important just to reiterate what you said about living mulch. So living, and the mulch might even not be the right word for it, but creating a garden that has those layers and thinking about, I mean, I know it seems like there's a lot to think about. Not only do you think about the layers of the, the space that you're creating, and you want to design for the early, the cool season, as Don just said, the early ones, the mid, the late, those Ansonias in the late season. Um, but that's why we hire designers too. <laughs> they can do the thinking and we that's can right. enjoy. And just as a reminder, um, Homestead Landscape Division is a different website. It's landscape.homesteadgardens.com. 10% off right now. So go get that. Um, well, I feel like, whoa, I want to talk about trees. I know that we have, um, we've talked about trees in depth, but I feel often people suffer from tree blindness. I know I didn't make up that word, but we often think that our trees just, live in our yards and they don't need the attention that our perennials need or we spend in our, our edible garden. And that is true, but you alluded that they might need some extra care. So are you always citing whenever you're doing a garden, are you putting in some big shade trees? Um, we generally do a lot of tree planting. It's funny, we, you know, we show a lot of these herbaceous plantings, I think probably because they photograph really well. And I love that work, of course, but we do a lot of tree planting. Um, Again, I'm always just looking for, um, I like, kind of, I've described trees I like as uh, things that remind me of my mother's kind of gnarly arthritic fingers, mm -hmm. uh, which might sound horrible, but um, you know, I love my mother. There you go, a memory from your childhood. <laughs> <laughs> Very emotional person. Um, but I, I don't like the perfect tree all the time. Um, and certainly there's, there's places for those specimen, you know, that specimen white oak or American elm, something like that. But um, I do like um, kind of the imperfect, but in terms of what they need, I, I do feel like trees and suburban landscapes, um, you know, we're, we're not often specifying early successional plants. And so if we're kind of that late succession, let's say oak or elm or maple, um, we try to we try to engineer the 
uh, soil ecology a little bit. Um, again, to start with things like humic acids and things like leaf compost. And we typically do these blends of leaf compost with just raw wood chips. Mm. And we've seen really great success in root development in those types of uh, mulch plantings. I tend to plant very high, much higher than the kind of uh, recommended two inches. I like to see those buttressing roots really flare out in, in a garden. And you'll see that in nature all the time, but often you don't see that in landscapes. Um, you know, it's really important. And our, our staff, they're, uh, you know, I'm so proud of them. Often they'll pull trees right off of sites that the root flare is at the bottom of the root ball. Just, you know, the nature of production, even some great nurseries we've dealt with, that root flare might be buried in the pot, or more often we buy bald and burlap plants. And it's really important to, you know, not set up a garden for failure where you know the designer or the contractor is gone and in 20 years you have this beautiful plant and substantial girdling roots because the root flare wasn't set at the right place uh, or right height i should say and so you know inspecting your plants um there are some people who will even just bare root plants um wash their entire root ball off when they're dormant and only plant that way whether it's a potted or be involved be container um but certainly understanding soil biology a little bit and what tools that are available to you we use things like kelp often in the summer to reduce heat stress uh we'll you know foliar feed with things like kelp uh we use um cold extract compost teas as well direct from our agronomist which uh, i think is a great technology it doesn't really activate the um microbes until they're spread out in the landscape. So they're kind of held in dormancy. And so the, the teas don't go anaerobic. They're kind of suspended. Interesting. Um, and so we use a lot of technology like that, just trying to understand how do we start to get those materials so they can thrive in terms of stress? Um, because, you know, we're seeing more extremes. We're seeing more extreme rainfall. We're seeing more extreme heat. Um, and um, we're just trying to understand that and plan for it. And that's not a political um, statement. That's just really us trying to, to be knowledgeable for our um, for our clients. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. I mean, we need to be prepared and help our plants be prepared so the gardens look as beautiful as they can. And yes. I loved how you mentioned compost and all the, the different ways that you're using it. But when we talk about this Chesapeake region, you all well know that you, you know, you are not allowed to put some inputs some fertilizers onto your soil. So, but you right. can use compost. You can use compost tea. Those are healthy things that do help your plants fight stress or pests and diseases yes. that are natural, that are not running off into the watershed and causing damage. So those are some really good inputs that will help your plants. That's that's right. And you know what those composts are doing is they are breaking down and creating acids in the soil, humic and fulvic acids. And we use just those direct materials often. But you know, the Pennsylvania is the biggest polluter of the Chesapeake, actually. Um, and so it's really important for us to be knowledgeable for owners in our community. You know, it's not just about this person, it's about what's downstream, and maybe you're downstream. And so I think that's our value add to the bigger community to think about, look, if we can build these soils, they will bind up materials like nitrogen and like phosphorus, which are giant polluters. You know, we're often over polluting or over fertilizing only to see that material wash away because the acids aren't available that literally bind up those minerals and make them available as the plants need them. And so again, even as a designer, it's and I, I began just as a, you know, not just as, but as a gardener. Um, and I hold that, you know, term in very high esteem. Uh, but uh, it's really important for us to understand these processes so we can, you know, create these thriving ecologies and not be creating ne negative experiences downstream. Because, you know, what we do today really does have a direct impact on future generations. And, um, you know, that is really important to me. Yeah. Um, and not only for what's happening today, tomorrow, next year, but also to think about why are we doing all of these things? Are, are they the right materials we wanna actually be working with? And, mm -hmm. and we still use chemistry in our practice from time to time, and we really work hard to understand 
even is that the best thing um and and you know why are we doing that we don't it's it's shocking to me when people say these things are safe um i don't know that they're safe uh, i'm not educated enough to say these materials are safe so then why are we using them um you know it's it's something i'm not happy about that my firm still uses some of this chemistry because we can't honestly go around telling people they're safe mm -hmm. um but we we can work as hard as we can to as quickly as possible get away from using them through natural processes yeah well that's great thank you and i love the concept of downstream it's really puts it in your head that it's not just your neighbor it's you know when we're talking about our friends here at homestead what i do in pennsylvania washes down to them so how we can impact our our community, you know, our little micro stamp that I have in my backyard, but then it gets wider, how you get impact to your planet. And Heather's reminding us that Homestead has kelp too. So thank you. Kelp. There it is. <laughs> there it is, Heather. <laughs> um, Heidi asked earlier, I think it was Heidi, it scrolled past a couple um, comments, but your favorite trees, you did mention oak, elm. Do you have any other, maybe some smaller trees that you love? Oh, um, Gosh, smaller trees, you know, halasia, underused plants, um, red buds, um, you know, we use some of the smaller um, magnolias and I use a lot of magnolia virginiana. Uh, you know, they're not always these really fancy cultivated plants and I have nothing against them. Um, you know, I have a yellow magnolia. I think it's Elizabeth in my house, mm. um, but I'm just looking for a lot of repetition. Keith's chiming in parodia. <laughs> um, I've been on a little bit of a parodia kick lately, um, Prodi persica, which is a really tough plant. And I am looking for those generalist plants, you know, not necessarily the specialists all, all the time that really need kind of an acute mm -hmm. cultural condition. I opt for swamp white oak, which as a marketing you know, someone in marketing, I don't know why you would have named that plant Swamp White Oak. It's such an exceptionally beautiful plant. Uh, we should change the name of that. But White Oak tends to be, um, you know, excuse me, have a little bit more of an acute cultural condition. It's kind of a, an upland plant, whereas White Oak can t take upland and lowland exposure. Um, and so, again, we just, I like plants that are just tough and can thrive. Uh, Aust not Australia. Um, um, I'm forgetting the name of it now, but um, there's a great native tree uh, that I use, and I've seen it in every type of landscape from growing out of uh, um, cracks in concrete to along the bay where it's getting sea spray. Wow. Um, not Australia. Oh. It'll come, uh, as soon as we hang it'll come to me as soon as we yeah, go. You can right. comment later if you do remember it. Okay. Uh, thank you. That's great. That's awesome for that. I mean, I think people are, are just really craving plant choices. And so that's where designers come in and help. That's where your homestead gardens experts come in and help help you pick those tough plants that Dad right. was talking about that will thrive without a lot of help from you because we are all doing other things. We want to enjoy right. our garden. I mean, listen, for me, even weeding my garden and being out there is, is that's joy for me, but maybe not when the weeds take over too much. So um, I, I guess my last question before, if anybody else has any, oh, Heidi's got Vitex. What are your thoughts on Vitex? Keith is saying maybe hack, hackberry that you're talking about. Is that the plant? Hackberry. Thanks, yeah. Keith. That's exactly right. Um, yeah, hackberry is, uh, that plant is tough as nails, very pollinator friendly, has a, a nice berry set that the birds love. Nice. Um, it's a it's a great plant and, you know, not really often used. There's a very private school not far from here and I was only on the campus, this beautiful old campus because my son was playing basketball there. Uh, and there's this hundred year old hackberry growing above their old gymnasium which is, uh, it's the most majestic tree and really just seems to be an underused plant, but um, a great umbrella form. And uh, again, I've seen that with salt spray on it on the coast and I've seen it in Philadelphia growing under, in cracks under bridges. Um, wow. That thing just wants to live, so why not? You know? Yeah, yeah, let it. Yeah. All right, so Heidi's asking about Vitex. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a beautiful plant. I love it. I've seen that. I've had it die back pretty hard in the winter at my own home. I was a little 
uh, surprised. Um, I have Shoals Creek in our um, our uh, studio gardens here, and um, I think that's a great late summer blooming shrub. It's uh, really beautiful. So why not? Yeah. Well, we've covered a lot. I mean, my last question was going to be, okay, hiring a designer, where can you save if we're going to go with you or we're going to call Homestead? Um, what are some areas to save and what are some splurge? You've talked about this a lot. You know, maybe already you've covered, you don't have to buy those expensive specimen plants, but are there any other tips for us as we're thinking or dreaming now about our design? What are some things that, that we can do and then areas where we need to call in the professional? Um, where to save? Um... Uh, bad shoes, maybe don't buy any bad shoes. Um, I, you know, I, we see a lot of kind of superfluous built environment. Um, I see these seat walls all the time and I don't know what they're there for. They kind of often they're hiding the garden or that kind of interface between me on a patio and the garden. There's certainly a place for them. But it seems like often we're just building seat walls and we're building these built in grills that look like big sore thumbs to me. And we've done pretty we've done a pretty interesting outdoor kitchen that I loved doing. I loved designing it and it was I thought it was really interesting. And that was all around the around the idea of the lacrosse team running in and out of the house from the pool. And so we built thought about a cabinet and then a refrigerator so there could be food for the kids outside and then the grill you know so it became this whole place and i think that was interesting but often they just look like these expensive sore thumbs in the landscape um and so you know from a modernist perspective i really think about these places and then stripping down to the basic needs you know where is their real value and we do that all the time in our own design work you know question uh, all right, this is the narrative, but in terms of the overall resources of the client, where are they going to find the most joy? And so we really need to think hard about what we're going to propose to them to make the project really exciting, given their limited resources and everyone has them. And so, you know, I, I'm a, I'm again, I'm an architecture person, but I'm, I'm a plant person. And I see a giant dearth of plants in the landscape and so where are you going to splurge splurge on more plants you know make your gardens denser i hear often that this garden or that garden was overplanted. uh but if you've ever been to a prairie or a spontaneous landscape there's just no such thing as, as over planting you know those gardens are virtually weed free um they're these really healthy ecosystems and that's what we're trying to replicate. You know, I get that emotive experience from plants and from the animals and insects that come into those plants and from the wind that moves through those plantings and the light and how they come through trees. And I, I just feel like everywhere I go, and this sounds very negative and I don't feel like I'm a negative person, but it's just, I, I look at our suburban landscape as a barren wasteland. And we just don't have enough plants that just make all these exciting interactions and bring those to our life. And maybe it's just the fear or the not knowing, and it's just easier to mow. And I certainly understand we don't all have the time and interest in that lifestyle. But for those who really want to garden and find value in it, I feel like there's just, you can never spend enough money on plants. And, um, you know, there's always room for more plants, for sure. Heather is having us eating mac and cheese and firing our housekeeper so we can have better landscapes. Heather, we're gonna need to be working outside. We're eating mac and cheese all the time. <laughs> mac and cheese these days is not even cheap, so. Um, but I'm with, I, I'm with I, you, Heather. I hear you, yes, me too. More plants, more plants, so, uh, and densely planted. It yeah. will save you time, that's the yeah. point. Yeah, forget, forget about that grouping of three, you know, Groupings of hundreds, that's yeah. what. Um, and, and just buy smaller plants, you know. Um, we're still not, as a retail industry, utilizing plugs. And I'm not sure why, um, you know. I, I, think, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for, at the retail level 
to market and sell these smaller plants that have less potting medium that would probably acclimate even faster into landscape for people and um, they can get more for less. And that's always what I'm interested in doing. So uh, yeah, splurge on plants. Yes. Well, we could end on that, but I feel like we just had a couple questions coming at the last minute. You guys, every time you, I say, I'm about to go last question, when people fire in their questions. Um, so Jamie, if you're still there, she's saying, very kind of specific, Don, but swampy backyard, so it's wet. She does have investments in drainage, but any water loving, maybe a couple perennials or trees that you could suggest for her. Let's assume she's in the Chesapeake region. Yeah, again, it's kind of a uh, context is going to be so important. I'll mention things like a chorus Americana. That might just look like nothing to you, but if you put hundreds of those, um, you know, composed with um, sensitive fern and even maybe seed in some jewel weed and um, uh, black willow. Um, you know, we, I don't often see typhia, which is a uh, cattails in landscapes, but they're so beautiful. And, you know, look, if you want to learn about what to plant, just go look at natural landscapes that look like that. And you can replicate some of that spontaneous, uh, vegetation, uh, hibiscus mastuettos. Um, it grows all along my route to work every day in uh, in and along Route 113 along uh, Pickering Creek. And, you know, beautiful plant, cornice, um, you know, uh, red twig dogwoods. You know, we have a lot of deer pressure that go after those plants. But um, certainly uh, plants like that and just going and looking at landscapes that uh, are evocative of that same cultural condition and uh you know you can learn so much about what opportunities might be available to you that is great oh my gosh you guys stop it with your questions everyone's thanking you all right you have time for one more question that's it it's yeah last question it's a little another specific one but i like some specificity too um oh gosh we go with marianne's or claire's Marianne um, says, what are some good shade plants? So you talked about the salt pressure from the ocean. So maybe some salt tolerant shade plants. Um, at the shore. Um, you know what? Um, um, uh, Packer works really well at the beach. Um, Dranium macorrhizum works really well at the beach on the coast. Um, draining phaeum will work at the coast and that will take pretty dense shade. Um, awesome. We, we can go on and on. I mean, there's a, there, yeah, there's a lot on the coastal plain and that's such a beautiful mm -hmm. landscape. I mean, if, for those who are around the mid Atlantic, if you haven't spent time in the pinelands, uh, vaccinium, low, uh, low bush blueberry, um, beautiful plant in the pinelands, a great ground cover. Um, not vaccinium cornbosum, but I think that's Augustifolium, maybe. Um, fantastic plant. Um, so, yeah, uh, if you're at the coast, you can always take a hike through the New Jersey Pinelands. You can uh, get a master's degree in horticulture on the coastal plain just from walking that landscape. So. How cool. How cool is that? Well, this has been so enlightening. We've learned so much, not just about landscape design and how to start, but some of the essential practices to make sure that we are creating beautiful habitats for people, for plants, um, but also downstream too, for those, our neighbors who right. are wherever they are downstream from us, because it's all about the impact that we're making. Uh, in so many ways. And you make such a big impact, Donald. We thank you so much for joining us you. today, sharing your wisdom. And congrats on Longwood. We, I mean, not Longwood, um, that too, that class, Laurie earlier. Yeah, said that that yeah. great. Um, but Philadelphia Flower Show. Oh, We're yeah. So excited. Yeah, but come visit. We need to post the link again because it's not going to be in the, you know, coming up soon. It's going to be in June. And they're holding it. I can't remember the name of the park where FDR. they're holding it. FDR Park, yeah. and it's going to be all outside, so it's going to be so interesting to see how that changes the way the gardens, you know, look amongst the backdrop of the city. I'm so excited for it. So yeah, make plans, put that on your calendar, stop by and see Don. So you're going to do one of the show gardens. We are, yeah. We have the first wow. garden you'll come to at the at the show. So. Wow, that is so exciting. Congratulations. Yeah. Cool. Everyone's saying thank you. Best Monday ever for this snowy day where it's still fleeting out there, but we get to dream of spring. So thanks for your time. I'll thank be you, back. Katie. 
I, Don won't be back next Monday, but I'll be back on February 8th at noon to talk about, we had such a great class on seed starting last week, so we're going to do part two, taking your seedlings and figuring out what to do with those to make sure that they are healthy and strong. Um, so join us next Monday at noon, February 8th, with Amanda Shepherd from the Home and Garden Seed Association. And um, thank you, Homestead, of course, for sponsoring this. It, it's Rewards Club members. Thanks to all of you. So if you're not a Rewards Club member, please sign up. And uh, I'll, I'll end us out, Don, on some of your lovely pictures. So thank all you right. so much, and have a great day. Thanks, Katie. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.